hey, look, for, for all of the things that our young people could be excited about in the world, right? They could be excited about sports. They could be excited about the latest fashion trends. They could be excited about YouTube stars or whatever else. I'm excited that our kids feel the freedom to be excited about something that is above this world and is in control of this world and who, who the spirit of the Lord, right? Man, I just think I was almost moved to tears after watching our young people come up here and celebrate Jesus with true authenticity. That wasn't planned, guys. I was in the staff meeting. We didn't talk about any of that. That was a genuine expression of worship pouring out of our young people. And it's just so incredible. I want to thank uh, Pastor Joseph and Zena and their team for everything that they did this weekend. They worked so hard on Ascend. And your hard work is not going unnoticed. And it's, and it's bearing fruit. As a person who is a part of youth ministry for a really long time, that's a special response. And it's a response to the presence of Jesus impacting their lives. And I just want to say thank you for your faithful work. All right. Well, for those of you who are new around here, my name is Kirk Kaufman. I'm uh, a serve as a pastor here, and I just want to uh, say that we're continuing our series uh, that we started last week on the book of Philippians. Called it's called "What Really Matters." What really matters, and this is an in-depth look into, like, like I said, the the book of Philippians, and we. We covered the opening verses last week, or the, um, the salutation, the first couple of verses of the, the first chapter. And in that, we discovered a couple of things. We discovered that, that leadership matters and that, and that interpretation matters. And what we saw with this leadership piece was because the people at Philippi were willing to adhere to the spiritual authority that Paul had in their life and willing to walk under his spiritual authority, it freed Paul up to be the leader that God would want him to be, to be the, the uh, leader that leads with humility. And, and he leads from a servant leadership perspective, which is a Christian virtue in leadership. And, uh, well, how do we know that? How do we see that? Well, because in Paul's salutation, he calls himself a slave to Christ, which is not totally uncommon, but it is rare. In many of his other epistles, letters that he writes to other churches, he demonstrates his position of authority, saying that I, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, right? Let's get this straight right away. I have authority, you need to listen to me, which is true. But with the Philippians, he doesn't have to do that. But instead, says, I am a slave to Christ and demonstrates Christian humility. And we also took an in-depth look at a very famous verse, verse 6. Um, and in that verse, it says, it says, I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Now, if you're like me, this verse has been thought of in terms of a personal uh, 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 you know, salvation type of thing. It's, it's like almost, uh, uh, a, 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 um, not salvation, but sanctification, right? We think of this verse in terms of sanctification, and I don't, I don't believe that that is the primary intention of Paul as the writer here. But rather, his primary intention was to demonstrate to the people at Philippi that, um, who are, by the way, partners with him in the gospel, that their participation in the gospel, their dedication to it, their financial gifts uh, that were given in terms of uh, procuring the gospel in the land hasn't been for naught. As a matter of fact, it, the, the Lord is the one who it, that work belongs to him, and that work will continue in the land until it is finally finished on the day when Christ returns. So it's primary, par primarily talking about the distribution and spread of the gospel. And so that's kind of what we talked about in, in, in more depth last week. But today, um, we'll continue on in this, in this sort of endeavor to take our time 
in God's word in, in Philippians to move slowly through scripture and see what the Holy Spirit may reveal to us. And so that's what we'll continue to do today. And I have to admit that we are moving very slowly today. Um, last week we covered like six verses. Today we're going to get through, wait for it, one. <laughs> we're going to get through one verse today. Um, it's, it's, we're going to break it into parts and then uh, and dissect it from there. But for the sake of context, I want to begin reading God's word today from verse 1 through 7 or 8. Okay, Philippians 1. So it is right... No, that's not, that's not right. That, that's wrong. Um, excuse me, where is that? Okay, here we go. Sorry about that. Uh, this letter is from Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus. I'm writing to all of you. God's holy people in Philippi who belong to Christ Jesus, including the elders and the deacons. May God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gives uh, give you grace and peace. Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make my requests for you, uh, for all of you, with joy. For you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. So it is right that I should feel as I do about all of you, for you have a special place in my heart. You share with me the special favor of God, both in my imprisonment and in the defending and confirmation of the truth of the good news. God knows how much I love you and long for you with the tender compassion of Christ Jesus. Let's just stop there for now. I also want to bring out for verse 7 in particular, the, the New King James Version, because that's what I'll be teaching out of this morning. The New King James Version puts it this way, just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. Okay, so last week we talked again about how leadership matters and interpretation matters. Today, I don't have two big ideas, I just have one big idea. And that is that partnership matters. Partnership matters. And we're going to discover how partnership matters by breaking apart verse 7 into three distinct parts. And the fact that he talks about how it's right for me to think of this of you all. And then we, he moves on to this next phrase where he says, I have you in my heart. Um, and then the third part uh, is dealing with Um, this idea that we are partakers of grace, right? Inside of the second part, if y'all are outliners, by the way, inside of the second part, there's kind of an A and a B where he talks about them being with him in his heart in chains and also in the defense and confirmation of the Bible. So we're going to have a one, a two, an A, a B, and a three, okay? That's what we're doing today. That's That's our roadmap, all right? So the first one is really quick. It is right for me to think this of you all. Now think what? What is it that Paul is thinking of them? Well, he thought of them with gratitude and with joy. We see that in verses 3 and 4. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. I thank my God. I'm grateful to God when I remember you, when I think about you. Always in every prayer of mine, making a request for you with joy. So he's got gratefulness and joy in his heart when he begins to think about the people at Philippi, the church at Philippi. Why? That's because they're partners with him. And he suspects that they're partners with him. Remember, the the sort of the larger context of the sequence is dealing with that word partnership that we read about in verse 5. It says, for you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ, right, from the time you first heard it until now. This partnership with Paul meant a great deal to him, and he was extremely blessed by their commitment to him and to his ministry. And like any man, especially a man in prison, 
he must have had to contend with thoughts of being alone and almost, in a sense, feeling abandonment from one, from one moment to the next. And the passage of time and the many miles of distance takes its toll on any relationship, even an apostle and a church relationship, a spiritual father and spiritual children relationships. Time and distance has, takes its heavy toll. But Paul stayed mentally strong even in the distance. He stayed mentally convinced that they are, in fact, partners with him and connected to him in relationship. He stayed mentally sharp in that. And this gift, which I haven't really told you the details about how the gift has come about. There's a man named Epaphroditus that the, that the people at Philippi send to Paul in Rome. They send him with the express purpose to minister to Paul and to give him this financial gift, right? And so uh, this gift that Epaphroditus has brought to him is only proof that Paul is right in thinking of them as he does. So he has been sort of reaffirming in his mind that this church is with me, they get it, they're supporting what we're doing, and in sort of these long expanses of time and distance, he has to stay mentally strong to that point, reaffirming that in his head, and now confirmation of that reality is coming to him through Epaphroditus and this gift. The Bible says that where your heart is, sorry, where your, where your uh, money is, there your heart will also be. Where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. And so, and so Paul knows that he's with them. And so he's right that they were committed. They are steadfast to the mission and to him personally. And how much of a comfort that might be, that should be. So the second part, he talks about this, this interesting phrase. He says, um, I have you in my heart. I have you in my heart. Now, this phrase is meant to close the distance between them. He's saying that you're with me and I'm with you. He doesn't mean that in some sort of simple, sentimental way. He means that in a spiritual sense. Now, the spirit is a reality. It's the truth that we can be together in spirit but not in person, right? I think that a lot of times we have a hard time uh, bringing our minds to this, to this fact, right? That just as real as our bodies are and as our current presence might be in person, so also spiritual life is real. And so also uh, spiritual life can make an impact on somebody's present condition, even if they're separated by a long distance. And so Paul is saying that that not just in a sentimental way, but he means in a spiritual sense that they're together in spirit, that they are even with him in his chains. And it was no small thing for a group like the people of the church at Philippi to be willing to associate with a prisoner of the Roman imperial guard. And they did, and they did so at some risk. They didn't just write Paul off because he could be damaging to them in any kind of real sort of life and limb way or even possibly even a social reputation way, but they stayed committed to him, as I've made clear now. But they've done so rightly because Paul is not really guilty of any kind of moral wrong. He's an innocent man. And so their support must have been incredibly important to him. In some sense, in a real sense, Paul is ultimately a political prisoner. I want to give you a quick detail of what that is, that, that history. Paul was falsely accused of preaching that, that Jews should abandon their heritage and become something other than Jewish. And to combat those false accusations, Paul went to Jerusalem and ultimately to the temple. And while he was there, he was recognized by some non-believing Jews who were from Asia, where Paul had been doing his ministry. And who were, they were familiar with Paul's teachings, they were familiar with his ministry, and they despised him for it. And so Acts 21 details 
this whole story, and, and we'll, we'll really more than just Acts 21, it's, it's a bigger story than that. It's actually quite a long story, and I encourage you to go check it out. But this scene that I'm unfolding to you now, you can see in Acts 21, where uh, these, these unbelieving Jews from Asia who despise Paul, they start rousing the crowds against Paul. And, they, and then I'll just read it in 21, 28. It says, they began yelling, men of Israel, <clears throat> help us. This is the man who preaches against our people everywhere and tells everybody to disobey the Jewish laws. He speaks against the temple and even defies uh, this holy place by bringing in Gentiles. Now, even though that none of that is true, none of those accusations were true, this caused a kind of a riot to unfold in the temple and in the streets of Jerusalem. They take Paul, they throw him out of the temple, and they begin to relentlessly beat him in the streets of Jerusalem. I mean, they're, they're looking to kill him. And it was actually the Roman imperial guard who comes to his rescue. And they ride in and sort of save him. They arrest him. They give him a chance to present his case before the, the crowds and to plead his innocence. And the crowds just continue to shout back at him. Accuse, they can't even agree on what it is that Paul is meant to have done wrong. And they have, of course, no evidence or proof that he has done those things wrong. And yet Paul still goes to prison. And it's a long story of he, he starts there and then there's an assassination plan to kill Paul. And so he's, he's hurried away in the dark of night to Caesarea. And then from Caesarea, he ends up later in Rome. But for the purpose of today and to establish this idea that Paul is a political prisoner, we can read in Acts 24, 27, where it talks about um, how Governor Felix uh, actually, uh, he's, he's about to transition out and, and um, he's about to hand it over to his successor and he has this opportunity to free Paul and he doesn't do it as a political favor to the Jewish leaders. And so he is held, an innocent man is held for political reasons in that, in that case, and we can see that. And uh, so coming back to Philippians 1, Paul says, I have you in my heart. You're with me in spirit, even in my chains. You share with me in this present affliction. And Paul knows that he isn't alone, and that offers encouragement to his weather-worn soul. And I could never try to step into the psychology of a wrongfully accused, wrongfully imprisoned man whose freedom has been taken away from him for the purpose of doing a moral good. I couldn't step into that, but I can only imagine that it's a, that it's a whirlwind of thoughts ranging from, from rage to hopelessness, and containing and suppressing these thoughts not letting them turn you into something that God has never intended you to be, a spiteful and vengeful person bordering on the, the border of lunacy with possible suicidal tendencies. That would be a real challenge. It's a mental battle. It must have been a mental battle to, in some sense, end all mental battles. It had to be tough. And yet, here Paul is, and he stays mentally sharp and focused on the larger task at hand. And he talks about this idea of keeping the mind of Christ. And one of the key ideas in our book of Philippians is the mind of Christ. So how is it that a man who's in a desperate situation like Paul's in, not only has the mental strength and the spiritual fortitude to minister to himself to keep his, his own mind out of the spiral of despair, but actually has the capacity to be a spiritual source to others? who are in far better situations that he's in. That's incredible to me to have that kind of strength and that kind of mental fortitude. I'm particularly interested in this topic, especially given that mental health is becoming more of an, of an issue today. So how does he do it? How does he stay mentally sharp and avoid the spiral that can oftentimes overcome so many others. And there are many answers to that, of course, but I'll, I'll offer this one today. And Paul has a cause that is bigger than himself. And that 
Paul has a cause that's bigger than himself, and that is that he is to distribute the good news of Jesus Christ and disseminate the gospel everywhere he goes. That is his cause. He lives not for himself, but for a cause worthy to live for. Remember, it's Paul. He says that it's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. So not only is it worthy to live for, but for Paul, for that matter, it was worthy for him to die for. And we'll see later in this verse, it says that, later in this chapter, he says that for me to live, excuse me, he says, um, Yeah, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Imagine being contained in prison, in a cell, and having more purpose in life than those who walk about freely. And that's a powerful thing. Imagine being contained under house arrest and doing more good for the world than than those who are free to come and go. And Paul found a love in Christ and a truth in Jesus worth dying for. And that's something, and that, what that did is that made it worth something worth living for, obviously. And that, to me, seems to be the thing that fortifies him against his otherwise depressing conditions and situations that he, that he found himself in. And he's got a whole long laundry list of challenges and desperate situations that he finds himself in. Just read the book of Acts. Nobel Peace Prize winner and eventual first black president of South Africa, Nelson Mandela, was also in chains, in prison. He was imprisoned for seeking an end to the apartheid in South Africa, which was similar to our segregationist Jim Crow laws here in the South. And for his effort, he was imprisoned for 27 years. Yet in that place, he didn't lose hope in his cause. He stayed positive. He stayed tuned in to his great cause. He didn't spiral out of control mentally and lose himself within himself, but rather he stayed sharp. And guess what? That that mission, that focus to affect change on the outside for the benefit of the people in South Africa was a kind of medicine for his own soul. Even though he was contained in miserable conditions and forced into hard labor on a daily basis, even though he was in the apartheid prison and still had, he still had this sort of deep sense of purpose and was still affecting change. It seems strange to say it, but even a prisoner who, who, who was on mission and on, and on uh, in purpose... He doesn't have the time to spiral into despair. He doesn't have the time to think of himself and pity pity his conditions, which leads to depression. He had a purpose and a righteous cause to battle for. I'm not sure that you can ever really live the way that God has intended you to live with with the mental health that he would like you to have unless you have a cause that's bigger than yourself. And I don't even necessarily mean that in the grandest of scales either. I'm not saying that every single one of us should be giving our lives to something that should and will end up in the books of history. But I am saying that you need to have vision in your life that keeps you going, that keeps you pressing on, even if things take a turn for the worst and, start to, and, and things start to look hopeless and things start to look desperate. I think that one of the traps of today, that is to say that if you fall prey to the so-called wisdom of this age, you will be tempted to select a shallow cause or a shallow motivation for your life or a shallow goal that you're looking to attain that, is, that has its end in self-gratification or self-indulgence or personal achievement or accumulation. And when you get there, like so many that have gotten there before you and have testified that this isn't how they hoped it would be and that it doesn't satisfy satisfy like they anticipated that it might. So when you get there, 
you like them will be disappointed. We have to be careful to avoid that kind of trap that the world would look to pull us into. The world that says accumulation is where you'll find happiness and self-gratification is where you'll be content and self-indulgence is, is, is all that there is to life. We have to be careful not to fall prey to those things. But if you select a cause worthy of your life, you will not be disappointed. You will find yourself being useful and needed and a part of the bigger plan that God is establishing here on the earth through his kingdom. And that kind of usefulness, and that kind of sense of belonging, uh, that kind of purpose is the lifeblood of mental health. It really is. You want to keep depression away and find your purpose and live it out. Now, I want to detail this out for a second because I believe it's really important. All of us have purpose. And spoken in its granular form, all of humanity belongs in two groups. Okay, and this is very basic. Belong in two groups. The group that belongs to Christ and has received the salvation that Jesus has on offer to us and the group that hasn't. Both groups, both believers and non-believers alike, have God-appointed purpose. God created them for a reason. Now it seems to me that those who don't belong to Christ have no real chance at living out their heaven-sent purpose. And if they do go to do great things for the world, which many, many unbelievers do, of course, great things have been achieved that are a net positive all over the world, all the time by unbelievers. But even if they do that, those things uh, that may even be in alignment with God's will, right? Even if they achieve those things, they won't have done it in the name of the Lord. And in the reflection of his glory. And so in the largest sense, in the realest and truest sense of their purpose, they will have missed it. In the same way, one may think that Christians have an easy road to living with real purpose and meaning. And yet it escapes so many Christians. Depression, anxiety, fear, and hopelessness takes its damaging effects on both non-believer and believer alike. Now, I don't think that what I'm presenting here now is a kind of silver bullet solution. Mental health is, is, is a complicated and nuanced problem. Of course it is. But, I, and of course, I don't mean to trivialize it in any way by suggesting that it might be. But I also stand by this observation that we can see here in Paul. And we can see many examples of this throughout Christian lives and history, and even in Nelson Mandela's life, we can see uh, that living for something worth living for creates something for you to set your mind on that relieves you from the burden of self-focus, which very often leads to depression. I want to say that one more time. Living for something worth living for creates in you something for you to set your mind on that relieves you of the burden of self-focus, which very often leads to depression. So hear me now. If, If it feels like your life is meaningless, if right now you're contending with a serious bout of depression and you can't find any meaning in life, you too are included in this statement, and that is that we have all been commissioned with a worthy cause to live for. All of us have been commissioned to the broad and the narrow work of the gospel of Jesus. Well, what do I mean by that exactly? You've been commissioned to the broad and the narrow work of the gospel of Jesus. Well, the broad work is being the light of Christ wherever your feet are. And even that word light, in a large sense, is a broad word. So let me detail that for just a second. What does that look like? Well, it might look like having a meaningful conversation about Christianity with an unbeliever. 
or it might mean meeting an obvious and apparent need that a community member clearly has. Or it might mean being an ear, lending an ear and being a shoulder to cry on for someone who is down and out. All right, so that's the sort of broad work of the gospel, to be the light of Christ wherever you are. But what about the narrow work of the gospel? What do I mean by that? Well, that's God's specific assignment for you in this moment, in your current season, within the wider context of the kingdom of heaven and its establishment on the earth. For many of you, that may sound scary, like in order to live your narrow work of the gospel, you've got to sort of uproot your life and reorder your life and maybe even quit your job and all these sort of things, which is scary. And maybe that's true for a very, very small amount of us. Only the Holy Spirit will tell you that for sure. You will be led by the Lord if that is the case for you. And don't be afraid because he's taking you to newer, bigger, better places. But if I were to to hazard a guess, I would say that the vast majority of us are are living a a different sort of reality. I would say the vast majority of us are, are living out our narrow work of the gospel already. You haven't, you just, you just haven't yet made the connection uh, that you are where you are because God has put you there. You haven't made the connection that you are where you are in your job or how, however you may fill your time in your days, that you're there because God has placed you there. And I want to encourage you to take the time And to do the spiritual work that it takes to make the connection between what God wants to do through you and what you do for work or how you spend your days as a part of his larger plan for the earth. It's easy to make that connection, right? If you're a street evangelist, like we get that really, really quickly. Like, oh yeah, he's doing the work of the gospel of Jesus. Like he's out there and he's pulling people aside and witnessing to them and sharing the gospel, right? But what if you're a teacher or a nurse or a bank manager or a plumber or a rancher or hairstylist or supervisor, welder, accountant, or student, right? I want to encourage you to seek the Lord and ask him to help you find the calling in your career. Because it's there. And seek him. And he'll give you the language of heaven for what you do and why it's important to the kingdom. Living with purpose is a a really important aspect of human life, to live with purpose. And God has brought you where you are. I'm speaking to the vast majority of you. God has brought you where you are for a reason, and he's done it on purpose. And when you have that revelation from heaven, when you've done that work, I want you to make, don't don't just say, oh, cool, thanks, and think you'll remember it, because you won't. I want you to make out of it a mission statement. A mission statement from heaven for your current season. I'm not saying that this is the the thing for you for the rest of your life. Some of you guys are maybe in, in between jobs. Maybe you're doing sort of a transitional job in the moment, but but seize that moment and say, God's got me here for a reason. i got to know what it is. And by the way, I'm open to the Holy Spirit transitioning me to the next place. I'm, I'm, I look forward to that. But I don't want to give up on today. I don't want to give up on tomorrow. I don't want to give up on this week or this month. I want the Lord to make impact in me and through me everywhere I am at all times. And so we're not going to do that without the leadership of the Lord and uh, being a people that have purpose and meaning to our lives right so make him make that mission statement for your current season far too long you've been working away without seeing your job from heaven's perspective and i want you to see it from that perspective i want you to own it and i want you to live it out one of our core values here at harvest hill says it deals with the subject of purpose it says that you're created for a reason find it Live it. You'll find it in the hallways. Not the purpose, the mission statement. (laughs) 
Part B, they aren't just with him in his chains, but they're also with him in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Now for Paul, the defense of the gospel was one and the same as his personal defense in court. And as a matter of fact, that word that he uses in Greek is a legal term. He's talking about the defense in a legal sense, which is incredible to think about. Um, uh, when he is put in the position to make a defense for himself to the Roman magistrate to be set free from the prison that he found himself in, he did so by making a defense for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul's life was in complete alignment with the truth of who the Messiah is, so much to the point of his literal freedom was in alignment with that. And here Paul says to the Philippians, that you are in that same kind of alignment with as I am, because you are with me in spirit. But it's not just the defense of the gospel, but it's also the confirmation of its life-transforming power. A defense is an intellectual case, like a court case, that draws on, say, historical prophecy, outside eyewitness testimony, and whatever sort of natural evidence there may be to make a case. The confirmation of the gospel is different. It's the, the confirmation of the gospel is your own personal transformation story. It's your testimony. And Paul is repeatedly put in the position to make a defense for himself, right? But before he begins that defense, he very frequently will begin by sharing his testimony, his powerful now famous Damascus Road conversion story. And the thing that I want to draw out here is that the strength of your testimony is that people cannot argue with you the details. And they weren't there. And because they cannot argue with you the details, they are forced to make a judgment call about you as a person. And it really comes down to two main ideas. Is this person crazy or are they a liar? Are they either one of those things? And if they can't write you off as a crazy person and they can't write you off as a liar, then what happens is that the power of your testimony gets logged in a kind of mental filing cabinet and a file in their mind as evidence for Christ. Whether they realize that's happening or not, that is actually happening and you will have just uh, been a light to their life. And so Paul, realizing this, very often starts with his own testimony. And so he is calling them, well, he's actually confirming in the, the, the church at Philippi that you are with me in the defense of the gospel and the confirmation of it because I have witnessed transforming power in your lives, church at Philippi. Every Christian has a testimony, and every Christian ought to be able to offer a defense for the gospel and for Jesus as the long-awaited-for Messiah. I want to make no uncertain terms about that. As a teacher of God's word, it would be one of my big goals to make, make us feel confident in our ability to make a defense for Christ. If for no other reason, for the, for the, for the things that come into your own mind that you, that you battle with, the, the doubtful thoughts that come into your own life. But I think that it's important for us to be able to, to communicate our beliefs. I'm not saying that every Christian ought to be able to be some sort of master of apologetics, right? That's a whole, you know, its own skill set and it, it's its own gifting, right? But I do think that you ought to be able to speak the language of truth when it comes to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And this verse affirms that, I believe. In the defense and confirmation of, of the gospel. Amen? Lastly, we have this phrase where Paul says in the New King James Version, he says that you are partakers with me of grace. You are partakers with me of grace. You're in alignment with my situation, my affliction, and you are partakers of the grace that God is imparting to me in my situation, my desperate place. That's an incredible statement. 
I think that's, that's a really exciting thing for us to think deeply about, that partners become partakers. Imagine the grace that Paul received from, from the Lord. Now, Paul asked for a moment, and I know I'm over on time, but Paul asked for a moment for, uh, that, that he would take this present affliction with this thorn in the side away. Y'all remember that story? Paul has its thorn in the side Ask the Lord on three occasions, take this thorn away from me. And the Lord replies, my grace is sufficient for you, right? Now, what does that mean? That Paul is, like the Lord is just barely giving Paul enough grace, like just this small amount of grace. You just kind of got to deal with it. Sorry, I don't have a whole lot of grace to go go around. It's just I don't have quite enough for everybody. So I'm just going to portion out this small bit of grace for you and, and just deal with it. no. There is an abundance of God's grace. God's grace is an ocean. I read something earlier today, and this isn't, not earlier today, earlier this week, and this isn't in my notes, so I apologize if I butcher it, but one of the theologians that I was reading suggested that the idea of Paul not having enough grace would be like the idea of a fish not having enough fresh water to drink in a stream, right? It's like there's an, like the fish is worried about running out of drinking water, like, okay, There's a lot of drinking water there for you to drink. The grace is sufficient. There's an abundance of it. And here, the the partners, the church at Philippi, get to partake in that kind of grace. That's that's incredible to me. He's saying, because you're with me, and you're aligned as I'm aligned, you're partakers of the same grace that I have. Remember that the whole sequence here is dealing with the subject of partnership, right? Partnership with God. Partnership matters. So Paul is saying that partners become partakers. And when you step into new places in Christ, I don't care if they're scary places or maybe they're fun places or maybe they're uh, challenging places or frustrating places, when you step into those new places, In Christ, you receive the grace that you need in order to make it through in that moment. And that's that's the really the thing that stands off the page to me in verse seven. Uh, Corey Tinboom is is an incredible historical figure, lived in the mid twentieth century and really lived a long life, Uh, but she was. she was in Holland whenever the Nazis invaded, right? And the, the, I don't want to go into a lot of detail because I'm out of time. But I just want to say that if you haven't read about Corey Ten Boom or her life story, get the book, Hiding Place. Uh, it's phenomenal. Um, uh, it's probably a top five book for me. Highly recommend it, um, Hiding Place. But um, in this book, she details this uh, story where she first realized that her father, her parents, would someday die. She's a young girl. She just went to her neighbor's funeral, and she realized in that moment, oh, my goodness, one day my parents are going to die. And her dad, which is this incredible, like, like the perfect father type, she, she presents him in such a, a great way, of a man of incredible wisdom. And, and she says, well, my dad could see that I was dealing with this, and he came to me and he said, "Uh, Corey, when we go to Amsterdam, when do I give you your ticket? And she says, well, Dad, you give me my ticket for the train right before we board. And he goes, yes, that's right. And your Father in heaven, who knows everything that you need, will give you your ticket right when you need it. So don't run out ahead of him. Don't be worried about things that haven't yet come. But know that when the time comes, when your mother and I pass away, you will look within and find the strength that you need in that moment. And so the Lord gives us the grace that we need when we step into those new places, those scary places. No matter where God may be taking you, I don't care if it's the scary or unknown place of entrepreneurship or parenthood or marriage or Maybe for some of you, Lord willing, street evangelism, we need it. (laughs) Uh, I don't want to do it. Um, I'm like my dad in that way. (laughs) Um, Now I'm going to have to do it. (laughs) 
That wasn't planned. Or I take it back. <laughs> or in Paul's case, facing trial and conviction and possible death, so long as you're partnering with God, that is to say that you're getting on his train, you will receive the grace and strength to get there. But as Corey Timboom's father so wisely puts it, you're not going to get that ticket until you get there. Never forget that every single step in where God is taking you, he wants you to take every single one of those steps in faith. By faith, with the drama of not knowing what may come, but resting in the confidence that you have in the character of your loving God, right? I want to invite the worship team to come up as we end. <coughs> Partnership matters. It really does. And um, it mattered because the missionary Paul needed their spiritual support and their physical support. He needed to know that he wasn't alone. It matters because when we partner with the Lord in the gospel and the spreading of the gospel and the wide and the narrow calling of our position in the gospel, we get to receive a grace that God has on offer to us that we wouldn't experience if we weren't in that kind of an alignment. So I just want to encourage us, just, let's just stand as we end. And I um, just want to encourage you as you go out in this week to begin to, not only to, to seek the Lord for that mission statement that I've asked you to make for yourself in your current job and what you do, how you spend your days, or maybe there's one or two of you in here today and you're like, man, I think I fall into that sort of first category that he suggested there's not a lot of us, that I need to really begin to think about reordering my life, um, that, that I've gotten to where I am not because God has led me here, but because I've led myself here. If, if that's you, I don't want to discount that. That's an important thing, and that's between you and the Holy Spirit, of course, but if he's speaking to you about that, remember, you just need to yield to him. You need to submit to his leadership in your life. And trust him in the steps that he's asking you to take. And take those steps by faith, knowing, again, knowing that his grace will meet you there. Yeah. If you're here today and you're like, man, I, I, I've, I've lacked purpose, I've lacked meaning, and I think that I'm beginning to spiral into despair. I don't, I'm, I don't know if I can pinpoint it as depression, but I know that I'm not... I'm not as mentally healthy as I once was. We're going to have people here. I want you to come forward and get prayer. Because God has all the purpose and all the meaning you could ever hope for, for you in your life. And you will find it by seeking him and putting yourself out there, spiritually speaking. So let's just pray. Lord, I thank you for everything that you're doing in this church. I thank you for this beautiful body of believers that you've brought together and you've named Harvest Hill Church. Lord, I pray that they would begin to be able to see their lives from heaven's perspective, see their jobs from heaven's perspective, see their career, find their calling in their careers. And they begin to see that you have them there for a reason. And now every day that their alarm clock goes off, it feels different. It hits different. It's like I've got meaning. I've got purpose. I've got a reason to go. And so, Lord, I just pray that you begin to show them those things, not just in their careers, but also in family life, which is so very, very clear that we can live for others in family life, for our children, for our grandchildren. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would just begin to infuse us with your sense of purpose for our lives. Pray that anyone that has any prayer request, any prayer need whatsoever, that they would come forward and receive what you have for them here at the altar. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed this message. At Harvest Hill Church, we exist so that people can experience a life in Christ. You know, Romans 6.23 says, 
The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I want you to know that that free gift doesn't start at the end of life on earth. It starts the moment you begin your journey with Christ. So that's us in a nutshell. We're all about receiving, like a free gift, every aspect of life in Christ. That's right. Kirk and I would like to invite you to join us this upcoming service. Our services start every Sunday at 1030, and you can come early for free coffee and donuts to be served by our fantastic hospitality team. Yeah, and one more thing before you go. I just want to take a quick moment, ask you to like this video, and consider sharing it with someone that God has placed on your heart. You know, every time you do that, it allows our videos to reach more people and hopefully impact more lives. We hope you have a great week and we hope to see you next Sunday.